Okay, we're going to take a look at New York 1776, designed by Grant and Mike Wiley in 2014 and published by Worthington Publishing. Now before we take a look at the game in particular, I'm going to make a few comments on block games in general. Now one of the first block games designed was way back in 1972 from Gamma 2. And uh, so we're talking about a game system that's lasted well over 45 years now. Now about a year ago I began shedding most of my block games. I only kept two in the end. I had to keep Quebec 1759 because it's kind of the grandfather of all these. And I have a particular interest in the Quebec campaign. The only other one I kept really was GMT's Hellenes, which I thought was a pretty good game on the Peloponnesian, Peloponnesian War. But the reason I got rid of the block game is, has to do with just the general system itself, and uh, I'll try to um, explain that. Well, one of the reasons I got rid of a lot of my block games was the um, kind of the combat system. I got a little tired of the, you know, um, roll to get a six combat system. For any of you who are familiar with it, most of the games you roll a series of dice and you need six to get a hit on the enemy. And uh, in this case, these units are fours. They would roll four dice, and every time they got a six, they would hit the enemy. So that system is kind of basic, and it hasn't really changed much in 45 years. Now, certain companies have refined the system over the years by giving classifications to the units, like A, B, or C, and that's fine. Uh, they've fine-tuned it and made it better, but it's still the basic system, and you really can't get around it. The second thing that I don't like about block games is it doesn't allow for a very refined order of battle. For example, these units here, uh, Agnew, Matthew, and uh, Piggott, are fours, probably representing brigades. Hard to say what they represent. Um, so the order of battle is a little coarse. You can't really refine the order of battle to show, let's say, a regiment of 250 men versus a regiment of 750 men. Uh, it's kind of either a four, a three, a two, or a one. There's just no getting around it. So those are my main beefs with the block system uh, in general. And that is in no way a reflection against this game in particular. Just all the block games sort of inherently have that, uh, uh, I hate to say flaw, but inherent characteristic. So why did I buy this game? Well, for one, I have a particular interest in the New York campaign of 1776. It's a fascinating campaign to read about and uh, study, and that's because of the terrain. So let's, uh, that's the last word on my criticisms of the block games. Let's look at New York 1776 in particular. As you can see, the game is long and skinny. That's just because, uh, well, that's the nature of the beast. So we'll take a closer look here and uh, see what's what. Well, here we have the city of New York itself on Manhattan Island. Why do they call it Manhattan Island? Well, because in the end it really is an island. Long, skinny, and you've got the Harlem River here virtually making Manhattan an island. This is Long Island, or a portion of it. Let me see a portion of it here. That's Staten Island. And of course over here is the New Jersey shore. Polisuk, Hoboke, uh, Fort Lee, Gloucester, Schrellenberg, and so on, Tappan. And of course, way up here in the north, you've got Dobbs Ferry, White Plains, and uh, over here you've got Kipps Bay, where the British landed and attempted to cut off Washington, Flushing, Astoria, and good old Brooklyn. Now, these little wee forts are delineated with these little wee fort markers. You've got fortifications at Brooklyn, uh, New York City itself. Paul's Hook, Fort Lee, and Fort Washington. So, why am I interested in this campaign? Well, it's an interesting campaign because it could have been one of the most decisive of the Revolution. It takes place early in the Revolution, the summer of 1776, and of course, Pitt's Howe's army against Washington's. And it was the only campaign that could have decided the war early. I mean, if um, Washington's army had been trapped in New York City, and destroyed that, well, God knows where the revolution could have gone. With Washington captured and the Continental Army destroyed that early in the war, perhaps the war would not have even continued. We'll never know. 
but uh, the British certainly missed a chance here to um, end the revolution early and uh, that's why I find it interesting plus the way the terrain works with the British being able to dominate the waters all around New York makes you wonder sometimes why Washington even tried to defend the place well Congress kind of hinted that they would have liked it um, defended so Washington did so his personal view was that they should burn the city and get the heck out but you don't win wars by burning your own cities and retreating so he had to make an attempt to defend New York City and that's what this campaign is all about uh, so this is really on the operational scale let's take a look at a typical setup okay there's a typical setup now the rules state that one half of the American units must start on uh, New York City itself so I've put um, a good 14 units there and the rest over here in Brooklyn Heights. Other setups might be to put some men here at Paulus Hooks, uh, Paulus Hook, New Jersey. I don't know. I don't know what the optimum setup is. I've only played one game and I got defeated soundly by my son. Now I've done an analysis of the uh, combat factors in the units. This might give you an idea what the game's all about. The Americans have 28 blocks. The uh, British have 21 blocks. Uh, they have three ships also. So in blocks, you know, they're about equal, 28 to 21 blocks. In combat factors, the Americans have 68 combat factors, the British have 72. So they're about equal there too. Where the disparity comes in though is in the militia. 35 of those American combats are um, militia and they break and are very fragile. The British also have 16 Hessians, which are very good against militia units. So the order of battle is interesting to say the least. You have to try to use your troops the best way you can when you get into a tactical battle. So um, many people have commented that the game has many similarities to Quebec 1759. And in that sense, they're correct. Because with the use of the naval vessels, it works a lot like Quebec 1759. Now, the command structure is also very interesting. Okay, the command structure is similar to both sides. Each side gets three leaders, Washington, Green, and Lee, Heister, Clinton, and Howe. And Washington, for example, can move nine other units beside himself, and they can move two spaces per turn. Green can move eight units and move two spaces per turn. Lee can move nine units, but only move one space per turn. Same conditions are there for the British Heister, 7 and 2, Clinton 9 and 2, Howe 10 and 1. So the structure is similar. You get two real good generals and one uh, one of poorer quality, we'll say. So as a rule of thumb, one of the things you might want to do is um, make sure you've got enough leadership to move all the blocks. You don't want to be captured or caught in a space not being able to move all your men. Um, certainly the same is true for the British. So often you break up the army into three divisions to move. Not always, but sometimes you do. Now, as with all block games, I haven't seen one that doesn't suffer from this. It's the, the counter clutter. Um, you get a lot of blocks in one space, and that can be problematic. It's almost as if, by default, the company should just make their boards twice as large. I think the counter clutter would be a lot less if the boards were bigger. But the economics of publishing, I guess you can't always do that. So I got around that by um, uh, making my own little wee counter um, aids by using these division uh, counters I made up. And when my son and I played it, we found it very useful. When you have a big clump, let's say you just put a second division uh, marker on it, move them off to the side of the board where they're not in the way, and then just put a second division marker. Uh, we found it a lot easier to tell who's who, because when you're sitting there on your side of the board and all you see is a clump of men, this way you can have them sort of facing the way you want, see the size, and uh, just put a division marker on it to show you uh, which division it belongs to. It's very handy when um, uh, moving the men. Um, so, for example, Washington over there, instead of that big clump, you can put this first division marker on, move the whole clump to the side, and uh, 
it makes the counter clutter uh, a lot easier to deal with. Now, when you remove the troops from a particular space, when the British and the Americans collide in one space, you have a battle, and you have to take all these units off and move them over the battle board. Again, I just made a little remarker to show where the battle site was. Sometimes you might forget when you have a lot of counters all over the place. So we found this a very useful player aid. You might want to make some of them up uh, for your game if you get it. Okay, the mechanics of the game move are very interesting. The British always start with uh, two action points. The Americans always start with one. Each turn, both sides will roll a die. And if you roll even, you get two more action points. If you roll odd, you get one action point. So in a typical example, let's say the British rolled a four and the Americans rolled a one. The British would get two action points. Let's slide this up to four and the Americans could get one more action point. Slide this up to two. And the side that has the lowest action points moves first. So you have this nice little dynamic where you don't know, well most of the time the Americans are going to go move and move first. But occasionally when you have a tie, ties make the British go first. So this little dynamic is, is simple but it's kind of interesting. Most of the time, Americans going first, odd time, the British will go first. And when the British roll even, you put this little ship marker on here, indicating that the ships can move that turn. If the British roll odd, the ships cannot move. Now, by move, I mean literally moving the ships into other sea zones. To be used as a transport, the ships don't actually move. So. Even if you roll odd, the British can move their units from Staten Island across the harbor here to, in this case, either Densus Ferry, Gravesend, um, or they could go across over there to Constable Point on the Jersey side. So, in that sense, it's a little bit like um, Quebec 1759. The opening is a little bit similar. So the British will be moving by water for the first turns, for sure, to cross over to the other side. So the Americans have the decision to, you know, should they defend here on the shore at Densus Ferry? Because you get advantages when the British come across the water there. Or should you fall back and uh, defend closer to the city? There's also rules for the Brooklyn Heights and New York. The British are not allowed to enter Zone D if the Americans are in control of New York City and the Brooklyn Heights. So, no fleet movement into the East River until one of these spaces is cleared. The same is true for Zone A over here. If Paulus Hook is occupied by the Americans and New York City, the British may not move vessels into Zone A. Now, in my uh, practice game with my son, I took the Americans and um, I foolishly held on to New York City uh, much too long. My son moved uh, ships up the um, Hudson, uh, eventually moved some British here into New Jersey and outflanked me and got in my rear and there's uh, all kinds of rules for um, line of supply which Matt had cut and uh, I lost horribly. The Americans must be able to trace supply to one board edge and with Matt cutting my supply here I was in bad trouble, especially when the British got over here uh, onto Long Island at Astoria. So watch out for that if you're Americans. The Americans have, to, uh, have got to play a very careful game. Uh, one commenter said he doesn't like the game because all the, the Americans just, uh, just run. Uh, I don't agree. I think the Americans have to halt somewhere, inflict casualties on the British. And um, I, I find it a very good game of maneuver and combat. Let's see how the uh, combat works, because I've said before that these block games all have the same kind of combat system. Let's see uh, why this one is a little bit different, a little bit more refined, and why I like it. Okay, here's what a typical battle might look like from the British point of view. Let's say the British were attacking. Well, what the defender does is he puts a unit in his right, center, and left flank and you can have some men in reserve here if you wish to. In this particular example we won't choose any. 
and then the British would deploy and put men in there, left, center, and right. And we'll see in this case, we have the British put one man in reserve. You then put the units down to show their actual strengths, like so, like every other block game you've seen. Now I'm going to turn the Americans around so you can see the numbers. Of course, that won't happen in a face-to-face -face game. Okay, we've exposed the units now. And this is where the, um, <clears throat> the hidden aspect of the block system is kind of nice because you don't know what the enemy's got. And in this game, it does make a difference. This is one of the reasons I like the way they've tweaked the battle system here. Why? Or what's so great about it? Well, the Hessians. Most units require a six to hit the enemy. Nothing new there. But the artillery in this game will hit on a five or six. So this unit here will hit on a five or six. There's some artillery there. They'll hit on a five or six. The other thing that the British have going for them is if they roll a one, militia units will route right off the board. But against Hessians, Hessians cause militia to route on a one or a two, and that's quite powerful. So I found that for optimum tactics for the British, good idea to put some Hessians in each part of your line. Because usually you're going to be f facing militia. Of course, the Americans could take the chance and put all their militia on one flank. There's just many ways the setup can go. That's what I really like about the game. So what we'll do is we'll do one round of combat to show you uh, how it works. And uh, since the Americans are defending, they will fire first. So we'll begin with this flank. Now, what I did was I took some dice and uh, chose some colored ones. So, for example, when you're rolling uh, the artillery here, I take sort of three uh, blue dice and these are uh, militia, then I sort of take eight red dice. This one I'm not ro rolling a bunch of dice. It might be, well all block games I find it's always handy to have lots of dice handy. So in this case the Americans will hit on a five or six with their artillery and only a six with the militia. Let's see what happens. Okay, so we're rolling the die and the Americans are firing first. Okay. Well, there's the results. I see three, one, two, woo, nice roll. Nope, three sixes. Okay, so three sixes. The British want to take three hits. Um, I'll distribute the casualties. You don't have to in your game, but I'll take one off the Hessians, one off Grant, and one off Erskine. And that's the American fire. Okay, now in the center, Americans have three militia. Now, leaders, by the way, roll one dice. So we're talking four, six, the Americans are going to roll eight dice in the center. Okay, rolling the center. And we get there two hits on the British. And again, I'll distribute the losses. Take one off of the Murbach Regiment or Brigade and one off Matthew. And on the left, Americans will be rolling five, seven, eight, nine, ten dice. Let's see what they get. Okay, rolling. And they do, they get two hits on that flank. So that's about average. We'll take one hit off Donop. And, uh, hmm, I won't take it off the artillery. Take it off a of Smith here. Now the British get to move and fire. Now, when units are in reserve, they can move or fire. So in this case, I'm not sure if the battle will last beyond one round, but I'll move uh, this brigade up to the right flank. But because it moved, it will not be able to fire. So the British will now fire, and they will have three dice with artillery and nine dice with infantry. Okay, the British rolling 12 dice. I've used three colored dice to indicate the artillery. And let's see what they get. Okay, we've got a whole host of results there. Because remember when the British roll ones, they route militia. So I see one, two, three ones at least. That means three militia route. We have a one or two, and the Hessians, oh, I, that's right, I made a mistake. I should have had a colored dice for the Hessians too. Irregardless, since they rolled three ones, three of those militia route right off the board. Now, how many hits did we get? We only got one hit. Now, the Americans are allowed to take the hit on the militia and route it off 
the board. That's quite legal. So that's the result of that attack. This flank is now in trouble. In the center, the British will be rolling 10 dice, three of which will be by Hessians. So I'll pick a colored dice for that. Oh, misspoke that. It's actually 11 dice because Clinton gets a die also. The British rolling in the center. And they got a variety of results there too. We've got at least two hits. Well, one hit there. A hit there, and that's from the Hessians that rolled a one, uh, two, ones of twos. So they route, well, all the militia are routed off, that's for sure, and they've got two hits. So the Americans are allowed to take the hits off the militia, which are going to route anyway, and off the scamper. So you can see the uh, deficiencies of militia in this game. That's what Washington had to deal with. And over on the left, the British will be rolling three, six, nine, ten dice again, three of which are uh, Hessians and three are uh, Artori. So I better roll them separately. Let's roll the three Artori first. Okay, no fives or sixes. Okay, now we'll roll the three Hessians. They have uh, a one, which means one militia will route. We'll route that one. And now the um, British will be rolling four dice. And away we go. And we get two militia routing. So that routes and that routes off the field. So that's a typical round of battle. You can see that the uh, types of units make a difference. Still a lot of luck involved, of course. These block games always have a lot of luck. But that's the nature of the beast. Now after this, um, I don't know if the Americans would want to stick around. I don't think so. So I think at this point the Americans might take a voluntary retreat. Now when you take a voluntary retreat, the enemy infantry gets one die to do pursuit fire. So the British have one, two, three, four, uh, yeah, four, five, six, seven, eight infantry. So they're going to roll eight dice in pursuit. Roll a die here, eight. And we have one, two, three hits. So the Americans must take three hits. Let's go one, two, and three. And the rest escape off the board. And of course, on the strategic board, mm -hmm. if the battle is taking place there, for example, the Americans would retreat from Flushing to Astoria, much like other block games. So that's how a typical battle goes. A nice little refinement on the system. I'll say a few more words about the strategy, and uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Now, one of the important spots on the game is White Plains. White Plains kind of represents the connections to the colony of Connecticut. So if the British ever occupy White Plains, the Americans must lose one entire unit of Connecticut militia. Much like Cap Rouge served in the old Quebec 1759 game. So the Americans certainly want to prevent the British from capturing White Plains. The other little magic hex is New York City itself. If the British occupy New York City, each turn they hold it, one New York City militia must be used, uh, removed rather. So um, you have to watch out for that. The main thing you have to watch out though is, is the supply line. Don't do like I did, get it cut off. If you get the supply line cut off, you're really in bad news. Now my son won the game by just reducing my army to next to nothing and winning the game on turn 10. It's a 20 turn game and uh, Matt had me beat by turn 10. So. Um, that's pretty well how the game works. It's a very good, pure strategy game. Uh, I think you can play a game in well, well under two hours. So it's a nice little afternoon filler. Um, it's one of the reasons why I bought it. Sometimes I like to get away from, you know, U.S. Civil War and Empire of the Sun and some of these very complicated games and just go to something nice and light. So. Um, that's my final word on New York 1776 from Worthington. 
a good game, and if you're into the revolution, I think you might like it. Thank you for watching.